Hi there. Uh, hello, hello. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. How how is everyone doing today? Can you please confirm if the audio video is okay? Okay, uh, I'm kind of struggling with the YouTube app as of now, but I'm going to work on the assumption that you guys can hear me. And with this assumption, I'm going to get started. Uh, this is a FRM part one class, and this is uh, you know, we're starting with a new reading today. It's an interesting reading, and that's why I thought maybe it's a good idea to uh, do this session on YouTube. Uh, the name of the reading, and let me kind of uh, fire up my presentation here. The name of the reading is How Do Firms Manage Risk? This is the second reading in your uh, Foundations of Risk Management first book. And it's, it's, it's a very interesting reading because it goes to the core of you know, the whole idea of risk management. Right. So in the previous reading, we explored those building blocks in terms of how to think of risk management. In this reading, we ask ourselves why and how. Right? So we, we start by asking ourselves, uh, why, do we need, why do we need risk management in the first place? And is like today risk management is an integral part of uh, a lot of businesses, right? Uh, I mean, we almost take it for granted. Uh, we look at banks, we know that they will have risk management team. Maybe, you know, they'll have thousands of employees managing different aspects of risk. Uh, so in the same way, what's... Was it always like this that the banks used to manage risk? Uh, you know, was it always like this that risk management was an integral part, uh, you know, of the banking culture or even other corporates? The answer is no. Right. So, so what we'll do in the first part of the session today is we'll go a little bit back in the history, and then we will see a uh, few data points, and then we will see how the risk management world has been evolving over a period of time. Build a little bit of background. And once we are comfortable, once we have a solid grasp of, uh, you know, the history and overall understanding, then we start answering the learning outcomes specifically. All right. So I'm going to start the session by showing you a really interesting data point on the BIS website. Okay. So just give me a minute. Let me ensure I'm sharing the correct screen. Okay. So we currently on the on the BIS uh, website, uh, there is a uh, separate link called the statistics. You can come on this, the bank, banks of international standards, and you would find a lot of interesting data points to work with. All right, so the first data point that we want to look at today is this particular data point. Uh, I hope my screen is visible to all of you. For some strange reason, my YouTube app is okay, it's working now. All right, fantastic. Yeah, okay. Uh, so you should be able to see my screen now. Uh, this is super interesting. Look at this carefully. This graph is showing us uh, what has been the the volume of OTC derivative transactions on a notional amount basis, right? So notional amount could be a little uh, misleading at times, but at least we get an idea on which in which direction the world is moving. Now we look at different derivatives and I just want you to look at the graph uh, through which how the derivative usage has been changing uh, in the last 20 odd years. So this yellow uh, curve that you see here, right? The first one, that's that's your total usage of derivatives on uh, OTC derivative. OTC stands for over-the-counter. Over-the-counter means uh, 
you know, typically institutional derivative, right? Two investment banks entering into a swap transaction becomes a OTC derivative. So look at how the volume of or the notional principle has gone up uh, rapidly from year 2000 to year 2008, right? Uh, I mean, at one stage, the volume, the total used to be roughly about $72 trillion. $72 trillion, if you can see that number there, uh, which is right here, right? $72 trillion. Uh, this is 1998 data. And there was just one wave movement in the OTC derivative from 72 to 672 trillion dollars. And then after that, the curve has been slightly flattish. Uh, and then as of now, the most recent data point that was available, in fact, I'll show you the most recent one as well, uh, but it looks like it's in the ballpark range of about uh, 600 trillion dollars. 600 trillion dollars right that's it's, it's a number and you know I, I just spoke it and you heard it and you're like okay cool uh, but 600 trillion dollar guys right uh i mean just to give you a perspective the us the the us economy largest economy would be about 20 22 trillion dollars right us gdp uh will be in trillion Yeah, how much? That, that's about 21.4. So about 20, you know, 22 trillion dollars. Right? That's a slightly dated number, but we get some perspective. So the largest country in the world, GDP, 22 trillion dollars. And when we look at the, the derivative number here, uh, the global OTC derivative is roughly about 650 odd trillion dollars of volume. And look at the, the astronomical increase in the size of usage of derivative. Now, we have decomposition as well. Now, by this time, I'm sure you have some idea that interest rate derivative is the kind of the largest component of the OTC market. So out of that total 600, uh, almost 500 is interest rate derivative. And then we have a little bit of, uh, little bit of foreign exchange derivative. And then we have uh, a smaller use of credit derivative. In fact, the use of credit derivative has been declining from 2008 to 2021, right? So this is just to help us build perspective on what's happening in the global market. Now, I was browsing through this website today and I came across this uh, interesting update note, right? Which is a June 21 update note. And here's what's, here's what's happening. Uh, as of June 21, the total notional principle is about $610 trillion. And somewhere they had mentioned that they're slowly, slowly reaching to the pre-COVID level we are here. Right? Slowly, slowly we are getting back to the pre-COVID level. Now, the question I ask myself is how and you know when did it begin, right? Because when we look at time in a when we look at you know derivative market in a point in time we are like okay yeah uh, otc is big market trades happen 600 trillion dollars big number but if i go back in history and if i try to search what was that uh, turning point or can i figure out one turning point where we say you know what suddenly from here uh, the risk management world kind of changed Right? And it's difficult to do that because there are a lot of different things. But if you put me in a room and force me to you know, pick one out of so many things that have happened in the history, I would probably go to uh, 1971. You know, I would say that probably that was some sort of a important turning point in the history of uh, risk management, especially the usage of derivatives. So what happened in 1971? 1971-72 is when the legendary research paper was written on option pricing. Uh, can anyone tell me what uh, paper I'm referring to? Which authors I'm referring to? 71 to 73, uh, anyone has an idea on what paper are we referring to here?
the legendary option valuation formula. I'm sure you've heard of it multiple times. Come on, which one? I'm sure at least one of you know, at least one of you know which formula I'm referring to. Yes, that's correct. I'm referring to the, the Black and Scholes formula. Right? So the three professors, uh, that's right, Sriram, fantastic. Yes, so three professors, Black, Scholes, and Merton, they published their formula around the same time uh, in the early 70s. And I would say that, you know, that was kind of an interesting point in the, you know, overall history of risk management, because since then, uh, the whole computing and the whole risk management world has, you know, kind of taken a completely different trajectory. So first we'll go and read a little bit about, you know, Black and Scholes guys, just to build perspective. We don't have to do the formula today. We'll be doing this in, you know, a separate, separate session. Uh, doing this formula itself will take us a few hours. Today we'll just kind of, you know, uh, know more about the people. So the formula was built by Fisher Black, uh, Myron Scholes and Robert Merton. And uh, th there was some thought process in terms of how to build formula and, you know, all of this stuff around it. So those guys published, you know, published their paper. Uh, Wikipedia should have some references to it. So those guys published their paper. The thing was that it was the first time where some sort of a uh, deterministic formula was built. Uh, or some sort of a, a formula was built, which will help you value those options, right? And there were other iterations of the formula, but this formula was kind of, uh, you know, made things easy. And the formula really picked up, right? Formula became really, really popular. In fact, you would be surprised to know that the calculators that you, you guys use for the FRM exams, right? Which which company's calculator are you using? The, the calculator that you're using, uh, which calculator? Texas Instruments, right? You'd be surprised to know that this calculator that you have is has been very closely linked or this company has been very closely linked uh, to the growth of the whole risk management ecosystem uh, of the world, right? Right way back from 1970s. So I came across a very interesting story. I was reading a book called uh, Adaptive Markets and uh, correct. And I was reading a book called Adaptive Markets. And in that book, I came across this really cool story about Texas Instruments and how Texas Instruments uh, is connected to Black & Scholes. Right, so I'm going to show you some interesting uh, pieces of that story here. Uh, I've put this in my presentation. I'll be sharing this with you eventually. So this is the you know, manual book uh, published by Texas Instrument way back. The calculator model is called SR52. Right? But uh, let, me show you, let me show you a little bit more first. Now, Chicago Board Options Exchange first of its kind, opened just before these guys published their option pricing formula in 1973. Right? So kind of kind of the beginning of whole option, option trading world. Now, rapid growth of C CBOE would have been impossible had the financial professional lacked the easy way to use Black & Scholes met an option pricing formula. Right? And the thing with this formula is it requires you to use logarithms. We'll learn that in the class, not so difficult anymore. Right? Now, as luck would have it in 1975, around the same time when the formula was published, Texas Instrument published this calculator called SR52. Okay, And it was the first programmable handheld calculator. Remember, those are the days when we don't have computers. Correct. 
So first programmable handheld calculator, which was capable of handling logarithmic and exponential function. And which means uh, you could use this calculator, you can program it, and then using the calculator, you can go on the floor and your you know calculator will do the magic for you. Right? Super cool. In those days, where finding you know right price of an option was itself a big challenge. Now, all this text is coming directly from the adaptive market books. You can look it up. It's a really cool book. Now, the price of the calculator that time was $395. So the inflation adjusted number in 2016 value is about uh, 1700. I think 2022, we're easily looking at about $2,000. So which means that $2,000 is a fairly sizable investment. Uh, which means it was almost as good as priced at par with computers, maybe a little expensive. SR52 then was a technological marvel. Great. Now here's where the story gets a twist. All right, so look at this carefully. Now this SR52 gets launched. Fantastic. Now one of the founders of this exchange, okay, his name was Irwin Gutak. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. What he does is he buys this calculator for his son. Okay, name is Sean. And then this kid uh, basically does some programming on the calculator. And what he does is he programs the Black and Scholes formula inside the calculator. Okay, so now the Black and Scholes formula is kind of pre -pro or programmed or customized in the calculator of Irwin Gutak. Now, this gentleman takes that calculator on the floor and then all other traders basically envy him because you know he has that uh, some sort of a competitive advantage that he can do the Black and Scholes calculation. So now within a year, all of these traders on the CBOE floor, they also want to have the Texas calculator, SR52. Now here's, what, here's where it gets very interesting. The guys at Texas Instrument, you know, they observed, they figured out that, you know what, a lot of people are buying our calculators for this Black & Scholes formula. So they said, okay, why not launch a new product? Okay, like how we have Apple, iPhone 11, iPhone 12, iPhone 13. So these guys came up with something here. Look at this. Uh, by 1977, uh, so this is, you know, about four or five years after the formula is released. Texas Instrument introduces a new uh, calculator called TI-59. Okay, and now this calculator has a module called Securities Analysis Module. And what does the module do? The module basically calculates the BSM formula directly, right? So BSM formula is integrated within the calculator. Now, Myron Schultz, one of the three guys, uh, he wasn't aware that Texas Instrument is launched. In fact, Texas Instrument never took their permission. So Myron Scholes, he went to Texas Instrument and he said, guys, uh, uh, you know, you've used my formula and, you know, it's, uh, you've used my formula. You never even spoke to me. So the Texas Instrument said, uh, you know, that formula is in public domain. So Myron Scholes said, okay, fine, no problem. Can I at least get a calculator? Uh, can you know? Can I get a piece of calculator? And Texas Instrument says, uh, "Yeah, you can go to the nearest store and buy one." Right. So, anyways, that that's a small small trivia that uh, you would probably want to know. And again, the reason why I told you the story is because I wanted you to know uh, that the reason why risk management world is so big today, right, is it wasn't the case in 1950s and 1940s, right? So slowly, slowly, 1970 onwards, all these, uh, so it's a 50, 55 year old industry if you, if you call it that way, right? And that's how things have changed. So again, coming back to the main point, how do firms manage risk, right? And today we're just going to build, you know, some sort of a large, uh, today we're going to build a large, broad view discussion on how risk management happens. Let's start making a list of few forms. Uh, let us start with, let us start with non-banking corporates, right? So 
so non non financial institutions non financial institutions let's say someone like uh, you know maybe an indian pharma company okay pharmaceutical company now do you think that even a non financial institution needs risk management like do you think companies operating in pharma fmcg it space do you think they need risk management of course yes right i mean they, of course risk management is an integral part of these companies you take pharma companies you take it companies now what kind of risk you know what kind of risk are they looking at right so let's say apart from variety of business risk and strategic risk typically a lot of these companies are export driven companies right? at least in india most of the pharma business it business is export driven if you're an export driven business uh, then what risk do you get exposed to you get the you get the foreign currency risk correct foreign currency risk which means your you know currencies could be volatile then you can also have raw material risk what do you mean by raw material risk the prices of raw material will go up you can have you know business risk reputation risk a variety of different risk now what these firms will do is they will take a decision on whether we want to avoid taking the risk or we want to retain taking the risk as in we want to keep the risk on the books or we want to manage the risk or transfer it right manage slash transfer so typically a lot of lot of these it companies uh, they would you know they would try to manage this risk with the help of derivatives okay so they would probably book you know they would probably book forward contracts or swap contracts and try to manage the risk so we'll look at one example in non financial space today and then we'll look at one example in financial space uh, so let's pick some it company randomly and let's see what is their risk management policy again just to build perspective okay you can give me suggestions uh, any it company that comes to your mind that we should we should look at from a risk management perspective indian international doesn't matter okay let's look at uh, let's look at an indian it company called uh, tcs so it's, it's the largest i guess largest private sector it firm in the country and <clears throat> we will look at their annual reports let me find a direct link in a minute Tata Consultancy Services. We're going to download download the annual reports of two zero two one. Okay, so it's a fairly large document. Let me save that in a PDF format. All right, and let's search for their risk management, risk management practice. Let's see what we get. Okay, and that's about risk management committee. Okay. 
Yeah. Fantastic. Now we'll not be able to read all of it, but at least we will get you know some sort of a perspective on risk management practices here. All right, look at this. I'll highlight the key parts. We'll read, read it on a read it on a selective basis, right? I, so to kind of build an overview on how companies think of risk management. Okay. So COVID-19 continues to be a challenge. Remember, this is 2021 annual report. So COVID-19 continues to be a challenge, operating in an uncertain environment. TCS global operation bring considerable complex cities and robust enterprise risk management. In the previous reading, we discussed uh, enterprise risk management, right? Uh, we discussed that enterprise risk management is about looking at risk from a uh, aggregate perspective, from a totality perspective. Now, uh, the focus on process identification, risk assessment, risk response, planning and action, and you know, blah 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 blah. All right, so here is their key risk. Here's the risk number one. Uh, listed below are some of the key risk impact on the company and mitigation strategies. Number one, one disruption due to COVID 19. Okay. What could be the impact on customers, mobility, workforce? How are we trying to mitigate the risk? Right. So whatever steps that they've taken. Then second, volatile global economic and political scenario. Okay. Now company, look at what is the impact on the company. It derives material portion of revenue from consumers discretionary spending discretionary means non necessary spending which is linked to business outlook if there is a political disruption geopolitical it, it it's almost as if they knew <laughs> russia ukraine is going to happen uh, trade war remember this is written in 2021 uh, then it could affect okay how do you mitigate a risk like this obviously what can you do in a geopolitical environment right so let's see what, what are they doing. We'll read some of them. Uh, okay, diversify. So have diversified geographies and industry vertical. Then uh, build long-term contracts with the customers and so on and so forth. Fair enough. Then restriction on global mobility. Their employees might not be able to travel to US. Uh, business model will change. Okay. Litigation risk. Currency volatility risk. Let's read this. Volatility in currency exchange movement results in transaction and translation exposure. Okay. Uh, just give me a minute. Something with my charging here. Just a minute, guys. Yeah, sorry. So we're reading currency risk of TCS. Uh, this is going to be interesting. Volatility in currency movement results in transaction and translation both. What do you mean by transaction? Transaction means exports. What do you mean by translation? Uh, it means they might have a subsidiary in the US. Correct. So they have assets there. So you need to bring those assets, you know, convert those assets back to Indian rupee. So all those technicalities. TCS functional currency is rupee. Appreciation of rupee against currency could impact uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is the currency hedging policy. Following a currency hedging policy that is aligned with best practice limit the impact of volatility on receivable revenue and other assets and liability. Hedging strategies are decided and monitored by the risk management committee uh, of the board convened on regular basis. Okay, then your breach of data, cyber attacks is another risk. And uh, then we have non-compliance to changing global regulation uh, IP infringement, leakage, 
I'm sure it's a pretty large list. Right? And then what we have, climate risk. And then what are you trying to do with it? So that's how seriously companies take to the risk management. And I'm sure this is just, you know, their uh, reporting framework, their internal documentation and the systems and processes will be really, really robust. So what we learn from this is that today risk management is an integral part of the business and every firm spends resources and energy and time in building those processes. So this was about this was about a non-financial form. Okay, so we read their risk management disclosure. Let's read one more. Let's read, you know, someone from some disclosure from maybe banking sector. Okay, so let's look at a financial form. Uh, maybe a bank, maybe an NBFC, variety of them. Now, in a banking setup, what type of risk do you think you get exposed to? Again, in the previous reading, we had an overview that uh, if you're looking at a bank, what do you think the type of risk you want to look at? You obviously have the credit risk and you have, come on, help me with it. Credit risk and what? Credit risk and and what? And, and market risk. Credit risk, market risk. Anything else I'm missing on? Liquidity risk, operations risk, uh, operation risk. And then we have ton of, you know, ton of other risk. Again, broken down into granular parts. So, yeah, yeah, spot on. Uh, so let's pick some firm. Do you want to take Indian or should we take international? I was thinking maybe, maybe JP Morgan. What do you say? We'll probably look at two of them, right? We'll probably look at two of them. We'll look at one Indian and one US firm. Uh, let's start with, let's start with, give me some ideas if you have, if you're thinking of any ideas here. Yeah, let's look at JP Morgan 2021. Looks like a heavy file. We'll start with JP Morgan, then maybe you can recommend me an Indian bank as well. Oh, it looks like a really heavy file. It's taking some time to download. All right, so we have 2021 annual report. Let's download the annual report directly, right? It'll be cool to look at that. In the meanwhile, let me also download some Indian bank. Uh, can you give me some suggestions? Which bank should we look at? I'm thinking, how about uh, how about ICICI Bank? They seems to they seem to be doing good lately. Let's look at ICICI Bank. I will download. Okay, I'll download the PDF of ICCI as well finally. All right. JP Morgan. This should be fun. JPMC annual report. All 
right? It directly starts with financial highlights. So I'm searching for some sort of an agenda. Okay, let me search for it. Now in a bank's annual report, I'm guessing risk management will be repeated a lot of times. Refer to liquidity risk management, capital risk management, 86 to 96. So somewhere around 80, I guess, this whole risk management business is starting. Yeah, it starts somewhere here. Page number 81. How many pages on risk? Uh, I'm sure plenty of them. We'll first have an overview, 81. Then we have uh, risk identification and ownership, risk appetite, uh, risk governance and oversight structure. These are the list of, uh, list of risks that they've identified. Right. So obviously, in a, in a banking annual report, you will expect risk to be substantially more granular, given you know substantially more weightage. So they have strategic risk, capital risk, liquidity, reputation risk, consumer credit risk, wholesale credit risk, investment portfolio, market risk, country risk, operational compliance, conduct, legal, estimation, and model risk. So roughly about how many pages? 65 pages in a 300 page annual report devoted only to risk management. We'll read some of them, you know, not all. I think it will be cool to read market risk. So we'll read certain parts of market risk. Uh, it would be interesting to read the, the reputation risk. So maybe we'll read these two, right? And then if we'll see if anything else com comes across. So page number uh, 105. Let me just highlight this here. Look, it's page number 105 for reputation risk. All right, reputation risk. Risk that the action or inaction may negatively impact perception of the firm's integrity and reduce confidence. Reputation risk management and governance of managing reputation risk across firms, LOB and corporate. LOB must have been some sort of a, let's search, I'm sure they've explained LOB somewhere. I'm hitting the word global constantly, LOP, LOP. Can someone quickly Google it and tell me what LOP is being used for here? Global, global, global. Oh yeah. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> line of business, that's it, yeah. So across the firm's line of business and corporate. As reputation risk is inherently challenging to identify, manage, and quantify, a reputation risk management function is particularly important. Firms' reputation risk management function includes following activities. Maintaining governance policy and standard. Overseeing governance execution through process infrastructure that supports blah, 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 blah. The type of events that results in reputation risk are wide ranging and may be introduced by firms, employees, client, customers. These events could result in financial losses, litigations, and so on. All right, so that was your reputation risk. Uh, 
difficult to manage. So I give them that. Let's read market risk. This would be super cool. This is on page 133. Market risk. Market risk management monitors market risk throughout the firm and defines market risk policies and procedure. Market risk management seeks to manage risk, uh, facilitate risk return decision, reduce balls in operating performance. Uh, all right. Market risk management function works on the following. Maintaining a risk policy, measuring, monitoring, LOB, corporate firm-wide market risk, approving limits, then performing stress testing and qualitative risk assessment. All right. What measures to use? No single measure to capture market risk uh, and management uses various metrics. Okay. So evaluate risk. We've already studied this in the first reading, right? Where we built perspective on evaluate risk and you know how it works and all of it. We haven't done the mathematics, but we have intuitive understanding. We've discussed stress testing. Uh, a drawdown means you know, a single fall, right? Like a massive one single fall where your drawdown falls, uh, like your value of profit falls drastically. It's like your portfolio is worth 100 and suddenly it goes to, let's say 60. So we say we, we have experienced a drawdown of 40. Then earning at risk, similar to value at risk and then other majors. Okay, monitoring, uh, manage primarily through a series of limits set in the context of risk management, right? So limit could be set uh, with value at risk. R limits could be set with exposure. So JP Morgan is basically, by, and most of the banks, right? They're managing risk by setting certain limits. Market risk management takes into consideration factors such as wall, liquidity, accommodation. Okay, so there's a lot of general blabber here. By the way, did you guys know that, I think we discussed this in the class, right? The whole VAR as a concept became popular and maybe it was invented because of JP Morgan. Did we discuss this in the previous session? That the whole VAR as a concept was kind of became popular and was maybe invented because of uh, JP Morgan, right? The new CEO, which was recruited, uh, who wanted the report, on his table at 4.15 uh, p.m. every day. Uh, so anyways, market risk management sets limits and regulatory reviews. Okay, fair enough, you know, now it's getting a little boring. So I'm skipping through it. Now they've given a list of uh, a line of businesses and they've said, what are the business activities and what is the market risk and position included in the risk management, earning at risk and sensitivity based risk uh, measure. Correct. Uh, so CCB, I don't know what the expansion is, but we can figure that out, it's okay. I mean, we'll have to search through the annual report to search it, but it looks like uh, originate and services mortgage loans. Originate loans takes deposit. Okay, could be commercial banking, I guess. I'm not sure, but it's mortgage, so no, maybe something else. Uh, risk from changes in probability of newly originated mortgages, interest rate risk, prepayment risk. And then, you know, they've done a ton of activities, uh, position included in management of VAR. We'll have to study this in depth. You know, we can't have an overview, but we get some idea on how it is done, right? And then they have a CIB line of business, and then they have explained that, and AWM corporate, and so on and so forth. Okay, there's good documentation on value at risk as well. Hmm. Interesting. They provided a table of VAR as well. Look at this. Uh, VAR measure using 95% confidence level. 
var can vary as position change market volatility so on and so forth the data is given in millions here it looks like a daily var to me but they have a fixed income var uh, foreign exchange var so fixed income var is about 60 million on an average uh, previous year it was 98 million right look at this 98 million to 60 million foreign exchange 10 million to 6 million so they've given var numbers here equities and so on generally the average var levels have come down and so on and so forth okay daily risk management var first quarter second quarter third quarter anyway so you get some idea right so you we building perspective on how uh, what kind of risk management process is happening within jp morgan let's quickly look at the indian company we have last 5 minutes of this session then i'm going to call it a day so we have downloaded icsa bank we're going to have a super quick look at that this is their uh, risk governance framework so typically there should be a lot of discussion on committees here okay so what do they have independent groups for monitoring risk in the bank so there is a risk management group there is a compliance group there is a legal group financial crime prevention reputation risk management group and these groups do not have targets independent reporting relationship and bias inputs fair enough okay key risk uh, impacting banks business first risk they have listed is the crisis and catastrophe related risk okay so crises are in the nature of economic events geopolitical natural calamities and you know what not here and then you know i'm sure they have general discussion then macro economic uncertainty is a risk okay credit risk let's read this our core business is lending which exposes us to various types of credit risk especially failure in repayment and increase in non performing loans our loan portfolio includes retail loans corporate loans which are vulnerable to economic crisis blah 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 mitigants so there is a credit and recovery policy and what else do we have bank measures and monitors credit risk at individual borrower level and at the portfolio level we have refined standard framework for managing concentration risk uh, limits threshold limits have been set up for borrower group based turnover and so on and so forth okay then market risk liquidity risk operational risk technology cyber risk compliance reputation employee risk international risk and so on all right so with this uh, i'm going to call it a day uh, again the agenda was not to get into uh nitty gritty today but just build an overall perspective just give you those hooks to kind of you know go and research more uh so if you found some parts interesting then maybe you know go to jp morgan and spend few more hours right explore a little bit more and that way you learn better tomorrow session will be on the app as usual the uh, usual timing will be starting at uh, 7 10 pm uh, india time and tomorrow onwards then we will start uh, answering the learning outcomes so it will take about couple of sessions to finish all the learning outcomes and then we'll practice questions all right so with this uh, thank you very much i'm going to take your leave i'll see you uh, tomorrow evening uh, on the frentry app directly right so thank you and bye